City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Clerman Endowment. Presents Spotlight. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is one of America's best-known actors in film, television, and on the stage, Mr. Tony Randall. Tony, welcome. Thank you, sir. Tony, you have said that you have a, an, an ambition and a strong desire to develop a classical repertory theater company. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little about that. I mean, when did you start thinking about this? And uh, I, start, I started thinking about it the day I graduated from drama school. Really? I think all of us have always believed in it. And all my life I've said in any interview or any time just talking with friends, well, I'm not doing what I want to do. I don't care how successful. All I've ever wanted to be is a classical actor. And then we all commiserate with each other and say, well, of course, they can do it in England. They've got a classical theater to go into. We don't have it. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that's a rotten excuse. They didn't have it either. They made it. They made it. John Gielgud and Larry Olivier went across the river to the old Vic where they worked for nothing for a woman named Lillian Bayliss right. and built the old Vic. They did it because they wanted to do it. And there was no national theater. There was then. no national no, theater. No Royal Shakespeare Company. And Shakespeare had never succeeded on the West End. That's a hard thing to... Believe. It is. Until John Barrymore played Hamlet at the Haymarket, Shakespeare had never been commercially successful on West End, which is their London. If they wanted to do it, they had to go off Broadway, in effect, to the old Vic. I mean, they did it. Their leading actors did it and built a classical theater. By the time Olivier founded the National, they'd had all that year, all those years of developing people at the, at the old Vic. Well, why, if they could do it, why can't we do it? What would it take? to make it happen. Fifteen you, million dollars. Really, yeah. <laughs> would you different. want to do it in New York? Or I believe you? it belongs in New York. Every nation in the world has, every civilized nation, has a classical repertory theater, which is the center of its theatrical life, and in many cases, its entire artistic and intellectual life. The Comédie Française has been there for 400 years. Uh, incidentally, all these places, like the National and the Royal Shakespeare of England and the Habima of Israel and the Comédie Française and the Moscow Art Theatre, they're all prize tourist attractions. The two national theatres of England are the number one yes. tourist attractions of the British Isles. So much for subsidizing art, that's how good it is for business and yes. for everybody. If people would only understand that subsidy is the wrong word and support is the wrong word, investment is the right word. It's a marvelous investment that pays off to the entire business community. Everybody knows how much the arts bring into New York. Everyone knows how much the commercial theater brings into New York, and it's not even very good. <laughs> well. Well, now, uh, Tony, suppose you had, just I, I'm, I'm interested in the way you think about this. Yes. Suppose you had the $15 million. Of I'm whatever. getting there. Are you? Oh, yes. Good. Yes, we're working well, now, on it. How, in your mind, how would this operate? How, what size theater would you have? How many performers would you have in the company? How many uh, plays a year would you try to do? What I expect kind of to open a year from this coming spring in a 1,200-seat Broadway house with a company of around 20 to 25 actors for the first season. Who would be permanently on the yes. uh, payroll. My, my co-director is John Neville, and I have a co-artistic director named Yossi Israeli, a, uh, an Israeli. Uh, director of Genius, who's been teaching at Carnegie Mellon in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we will do world classics. There is an entire world of great drama that most people, uh, certainly most Americans, know very little about. If I told you that there was a golden age of Spanish drama, 
You mean How many Lope, Lope de Vega, Calderon, and so forth? That's right. Yes. Two giants of the yes. theater. Yes. Lope de Vega wrote over 2,000 plays. I know. <laughs> I know. He never but stopped. He <laughs> never stopped. But some of these plays are very, very great indeed. This is part of our heritage. They are never done. They would be new plays to New York. For that matter, Ibsen wrote about 50 plays. You could have a theater of Ibsen alone, and you wouldn't live long enough to put all of the plays yes, on. Yes. And we only know three or four. We know ghosts and... Hedda Gobbler. Hedda Gobbler and Doll's House. Doll's House. That's right. But there are plays that are simply gigantic. Brand. Brand is, is one of the greatest things ever written. The, there's such a need for these things. And in the past 30 years, there's been such an explosion of the arts in America. There's been such an extraordinary explosion of an educated audience. When we had the Picasso show here at the Museum of Modern Art just a few summers back, over a million people came. A million! That's to see Picasso, that's the kind of audience we've developed in America. We've now imported the Royal Shakespeare to New York 35 times. That's the need that exists. Yes. Well, we're going to have it, and we're going to do it, and it's going to be on the highest level. I'm not talking about just the best actors you can get for $75 or kids out of school. I'm talking about our finest artists on the level of the Metropolitan Opera. Do you think they will come back and do this? Yes. You do? Yes. <laughs> I told you I'm a creature of blind faith. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, now, what? let me ask you, in terms of developing a classical repertory mm -hmm. theater in New York City, about the young actors we have. You studied with Sandy Meisner mm -hmm. at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Mm -hmm. What about actor training now? Where does it, how good is it, how thorough is it for the actors coming along, as far as you, you are aware? Oh, it's very, very good indeed. <coughs> the, the average is very high among the young actors. They know how to act. They know how to work on a part. They don't, they are not well trained. Vocally? Vocally. They're not well trained for world drama. They're well, very well trained indeed for American drama, which is uh, totally realistic. Would you think eventually you might have a school? We'll have to. With this? We'll have to. Have you to mean develop a school. just the same way the New York City Ballet and these other exactly. companies have exactly. schools connected with them? And uh, as, as all these theaters we mentioned have schools connected with them. In the first place, we'll have to start training our replacements from the day we start. None of us are kids. And so you would have, a, you envision a school going along absolutely with this. Yes, but not the first year. Now, speaking of vocal, it seems to me I read uh, your, your book, which reminds me. <laughs> <laughs> you need to mention that. I understand. Well, anyway, yeah. I won't say which reminds me. Yeah. Your book. Uh, but you spoke in there, it seems to me, uh, about vocal, a vocal coach and about studying with a vocal coach for many years or something vocal like that. Teacher. Vocal teacher. Vocal teacher, yes. yes. What, uh, when did you start, and, and did you keep it up for many years? And yes. When, uh, when I got out of the Army, we had the GI Bill of Rights. You could study anything you wanted, and the government would pay for it. And I decided to put, the, put that four years of training into my voice. I knew I needed it. I didn't have a good voice. It, in other words, we wouldn't have recognized it, the no. voice you hear, we hear now? No. Is one you developed through the years then? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I'm, some people are born with it, uh, just as some are born with huge muscles. The rest of us have to go to the gym and lift weights if we want to get muscles. And I'm one of those cases, and I had the voice is a muscle. That's all it is. Two little muscles in here, and you have to build them. You build them through the way you build any other muscle, through res resistance exercises. And I built a big, strong, loud voice. Not of very good quality, but quality comes from God. The rest you can do yourself. <laughs> What, so you worked for many years with this. You continued? Well, I worked 30. 30. 30. And then he died, <clears throat> and I w went to another teacher. You felt the need to continue doing this. Oh, though. you never finish. Yes. You never finish. So you, do you still go? Even oh, though? yes. You do? Not, not when I'm playing. Yes. Not when I'm playing. But, but, but I vocalize every day. As you can hear, I haven't vocalized yet today. <laughs> it's low. When my voice is low, I haven't vocalized. Oh, really? It. When I vocalize, it goes up about a third. Guess what? Up in here more, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the, you, speaking of young actors and speaking of the breadth and the range of acting in this country now, what about your experience in observing regional theater groups and working with regional theater groups about the level of acting that we have across the country in regional theater? 
There it's extremely variable, I must say. Well, d tell me about it. No, I, I won't, go, I won't well, I say mean, any more than that because... Well, no, because but I mean, just without going, I mean, when you say that, you mean that there are some is obviously much better than others. In some theaters, the work is much better than in others. No, in any one company, ah. the, the, uh, the, the mixture is very uh, variable. So it ranges from people who have obvious talent and experience and training to people who don't have very much maybe of all three of those. That is correct. That is correct. And so this is a problem then, isn't it, for this country in terms of our pool of actors and performers? Yes. What happens, of course, in um, all over America is that the, the bright young people leave the small towns, not only in theater, but in anything. And the places are left deserted of their best. The best go to the big cities. That's, that's the way it is, at least right now. Except some of these theaters people go back to, go out to, to get experience in some of these. Some of our better regional theaters, some of the young actors feel they can play more parts in those places. Yes, that's right, and they, but they have to. There's no other work. There's very, very little work. But th th that's not the way it ought to be. The standard should be much higher and the salaries should be much higher and a man should be able to make a good living and stay wherever he wants to stay and raise his children and have a home and have a career just as if he were <coughs> in any other business. Are you going to be able to pay good, reasonable salaries in your classical... Oh, absolutely. Classical no, rate? I don't believe in it being yes. subsidized by... The actors. By the actors. No, I, I believe that a man, a man has more pride in his work when he's... I'm going to change the subject slightly because also in which reminds me, you made the statement that you felt that screen acting and stage acting were really not that different. That's right. Uh, contrary to the popular belief, I think, that you have to be very different as an actor in front of the camera mm -hmm. as opposed to being on stage. That's right. What, Many people believe that. Olivier believed that. What Explain to me your thought, what, what you feel about his, the way he viewed it and the way you look at it. Well, who am I to argue with Olivia? Well, I understand, but... But, but, uh, but I will argue you've with done, her. But you've been, what, 30 motion pictures you've been in, yeah. and I don't know how many television shows. Yes, but I also I've seen Olivier in, in perhaps 28, 29 plays and an equal number of movies. And I think people who uh, see him in movies only wonder why the rest of us call him the greatest actor we've ever seen. He believed that you acted big on the stage and loud in order to reach the last row, and you held it down very much indeed for the camera like that. Well, I don't believe that's true, and I believe he did that, and I think that most of his screen acting is extremely his... boring. Yes. It's extremely dull. He wasn't letting himself go. He was a wild animal. He was a real animal, that man. And on stage, he, he gloried in being an animal, and it was never too big. It was human. When I say animal, I mean human. human yes. When I say human, I mean animal. It's the same thing. And, and you almost never saw that side of him. In, and that was his best. So, so th that, I think that proves, yes. if I'm right, that he was <laughs> wrong. No, acting well, must be human. You must create a life. Create. That's a stupid word. Balanchine said, only God creates. I, uh, I arrange little dances. <laughs> you must find a life. That's all. When you found a living thing, you were acting. It's acting where, wherever you do it. Television, Film, screen, yeah. or alone in your bedroom working on your part. It's acting. It must come alive and be alive fully, fully alive. I see these screen actors who whisper their scenes like that. People don't do that in life. Nobody whispers in life. Nobody talks like that. They do it because the, ca you know, the, the camera's, camera's close, so close and the up. mic is close. I hate it. It's not human. So in your, in your experience, you never tried to hold back or, or no. to edit or hold, and hold, keep it down. And did directors ever tell you that you were no. going overboard? Very seldom. So they wanted this. Yes, this, sometimes. Uh, I'll vitality. tell you when an actor will go overboard. Where Shakespeare says he goes overboard. When the actor begins to feel the emotion, he will almost invariably tear a passion to tatters. <laughs> He did it back in Shakespeare's day, and he does it now. He's so glad he's got it, because you work so hard to get emotion. But when he gets it, he goes like a drunk. He gets drunk on it, and he shows it. It's not necessary. If it's there, it's there. But you have to learn that. You have to learn that. And in every actors love to cry. 
They love to cry. The one thing John Dexter told me in, in, in Butterfly. Butterfly. No tears. So I fight to hold them back. Well, that's much better. Yes. Much better. Let the audience cry. Yeah. But uh, so in, in all of the, and what about television and film? Is Same there, thing. Is there a difference there? there? There is a, one other difference in stage acting. That is that many stage actors talk very loud when they're out there. <laughs> they say, well, I have a secret to tell you. <laughs> That's because they have weak voices. So they have to shout. If you have a well-developed voice, it's resonant, has a ping that, that carries, you don't have to shout. <laughs> and so the in terms of this this business of the screen and television and all of this kind of thing as far as you're concerned it's the same no matter what stage yes. screen yes and uh television and and the, making it very big or making it very small is immaterial charlie chaplin was huge he just thinks something so is cary grant and so is gary cooper gary cooper we think of him as the oh shucks, yes uh, taciturn? No. That guy mugged and made faces and did things. Wonderful! Because it was, it it was, was his life. own. It was, yes. it was his life and had a sense of enjoyment behind it, too. You know, Stanislavski said Gary Cooper's the best actor I've ever seen. Oh, really? So I've heard that. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it's true. Well, because <laughs> he was enjoying what he was doing. And he was so have real. You, have you, you look as if you've enjoyed every many of the... Every minute of it. Every, really? Every Are there penny. Uh, penny. I would do... When I think that they pay me for what I'm having so much fun doing. I, I remember when Willie Mays came up in baseball. He couldn't believe they were paying him <laughs> to play he, in the big leagues. Because he was having so much fun. And all he'd ever wanted was to play in the big leagues. And they're giving him money as well. <laughs> so you felt, have you felt that way all the way through? All my life. Let me ask you about when you play in a thing like The Odd Couple mm -hmm. or some other, or Mr. Peepers, the early television mm -hmm. show you did. But let's just take The Odd Couple. Did you find it hard to keep everything up week after week after week no. after week. What, was there a, a new challenge each week? Was well, there's a new script every new week. Script. If you're talking about the TV series. Yes. If you're talking about the play, I've played it in nine different productions. And, and I've never found it boring or, or repetitious. What do you do to... Let's, let's take then the play for a moment mm -hmm. before we get to the television. What, if you've done, been in nine different productions and you've toured with that, and I think you've been to Australia and yes. everywhere else yes. with it. I've had uh, four Oscars. <laughs> yes. How uh, How do you get it every time? Yes, how do you get it every time? You must be a good boy. What does that mean? You must be a good you must remember what you were taught in school. You must go back to the beginning every single performance. Do you do something consciously to yes. what do you do to to make that happen each time? That is this going back to the beginning. Well, in the case of Felix, he doesn't come on for uh, 17 minutes. They talk about him for those 17 minutes. The man has broken up with his wife the day before. He's been walking the streets, and he's attempted suicide. Or at least he says he's, he's attempted, attempted suicide. The actor playing it must use those 17 minutes to go through that. So that when he comes on, he's in it. He hasn't slept. You're in a physical state. Haven't slept. Haven't eaten. Exhausted. Don't know... Uh, sort of days, don't know where you are. The only thing to do is to go to the, oh, my God, the poker game tonight. Well, I'll go there. I walk the streets for 24 hours. You've got to go through that and get into that physical and emotional state. When you were performing this play, of course, night after night mm -hmm. in different places. You do that every you single did that, time. Would you start that before, would you do it during that 17 minutes? Yes. Or is that when you use that time? Right? Yes. I, were, you, uh, were you sort of just off stage while that was happening? Yes. Or? Stand on the wings and do that. And you, but if you come out of the beginning, then you have to do it before the play. But you have to completely create for yourself the atmosphere of the character, what he's gone through recently, that brings him to that point where he walks through the door. What did you do in M. Butterfly to get ready playing Rene Gallimard, mm -hmm. this French diplomat? Yes. In, in I take, well, I take about an hour in that one every night. And what are but you... But the last 10 minutes are very intense. What are you doing during that? I mean, can you share that? I mean, what you I mean, is this... You'd have you, to know the play very well, well yes. to understand that the beginning of the play, in my mind, is only minutes from the end of the play. 
In the end of the play, he commits suicide. Right. So in the beginning of the play, he's only minutes from that decision. In between, as everything he's talking, he's it's reliving a, his it's life. A, it's a flashback it's a, type. The whole play is a flashback. Yes. yes. So you must, everything he talks about in the play that leads him to this last moment has actually happened before the play begins. And the, the character must go through it. You must go through it. You so, must go through the physical condition the man is in. What, when you're doing something that's totally different now, like mm -hmm. the music man, which mm -hmm. you've played, mm -hmm. that's a whole different thing in terms of, or, or is it? Do you prepare in yes. a similar... Yes, you must always prepare. Sometimes just preparing the mood is enough. In many comedies, the mood is wild and high and excited and, and a, a spirit of silliness and fun. Well, to get that going backstage is very important. With all the actors, you kid around, you joke, and you do everything. And you're, you're just kidding till the last moment when the curtain goes up. And you're, you're in a crazy school. You know, the teacher just came in kind of a mood. You've got to get it. You must, you've got to get in the genuine mood of the play. So that then you bring the audience into it instantaneously. Yes, I think so. And they also... But you forget about the audience. You're supposed to forget about the audience. Yes. But, I mean, that's what happens, though. If you didn't come on that way, the audience would be at sea in terms of what they well, were Well, then you're to... dead. Then you're not acting. You're not in it. You're not living another life. So whether it's comedy and something that is not digging deep mm -hmm. into a character, or whether it's Sometimes is... comedy does dig, as in the case of Felix, this man. Yes. Is that, is that funny that a man's yeah. broken up with his wife and two children? That's all he has in the world? The only thing that means anything to him in the world he's lost in the last 24 hours? Is that a comic state? Do you think that that's part of the secret of Neil Simon's writing? Yes. That is his secret. That the character, that it really is, as funny as it is, it's very serious underneath. Heartbreaking. If you, take it, if you don't take it funny, it's heartbreaking. Well, and as an actor, you can't take it funny, can you? You shouldn't. You, sh you shouldn't. You must play it as seriously as you know how. And, so that the, and the comedy then emerges out of your taking it seriously, but the situation and the juxtaposition with other mm -hmm. characters is where the comedy comes That's from. Right. But you yourself have to stay with that. I believe that. I believe that. What about the television series? I mean, the week out was, was, were you playing, how was it in terms of the, the audience and... Uh, well, we had week? an audience every week. Did that, did you like... Have, Love it. Love you'd it. Rather, have you worked in television without an audience in a comedy? We did the first year on The Odd Couple, and I didn't like a single one of the shows we did, and I didn't like the acting or the writing or anything else. Really? The second year we... W moved to the three-camera technique with an audience. And from then on, I thought our shows took off. What, how did it... Uh, you were lucky, I guess, that it kept going if you didn't think it was that good. Or was it popular even though you didn't think it was It was, was that never good? popular. Really? Five years we were on the air and never had a rating. You're, uh, really? Yeah, only Why one. has it become such a legend? In the reruns, it's become popular. More popular in reruns than it was in the original? It wasn't popular at all in the original. We were always in the bottom ten. And the reruns were one of the most popular of all shows, like up, up Where Lucy Is. It just, they found us in the reruns. But, the, but in the five years we were on the air, we never had a rating, and only one man kept us on the air. That was Marty Starger, who was with the network then, and had enough brains to see that this was a good show. But that's a very unusual thing in a television executive. I was going to say that nowadays they just cut them off. <laughs> they don't even look at their shows. They just look at the ratings. And so that would have been, would that have been... Lost now? Oh, yes. As Love Sydney was. Because of just what we're just talking the about. Looking at the ratings. That's right. And not the quality of the show. That's exactly right. How do you feel about television now as opposed to 15 years ago or 20 years ago? Do you think it's do you, uh, deteriorated? or? Oh, I think it's deteriorated. I think it started at the top and has moved down. The, very much the way movies did, in my opinion. Uh, when, when television was all live and they were doing things like you know, Playhouse 90 and Sid Caesar, when it, it was all exciting. Even if it wasn't always good, it, it was exciting. It was new, and the most talented people were coming out oh, of the absolutely. woodworks. And you, you, you sat there astonished, saying, do you mean to tell me that Martha Ray has always been this good in all those little movies? We saw? She's a comic genius. People were being given a chance. And they responded, the, the feeling of something new. Just the way Chaplin and Buster Keaton came along and... They were so excited with this medium. And then it got...
do you think the dramas that we saw on Playhouse 90 and uh, all of those things that we, the Philco and what have you, they, they had an energy then, you think, and a spot that, that, that we lose when we I go, do. To, yes. go to the whole taping process and everything They're all else. dead. They're dead. I can't watch them. What do you think about the theater now as opposed to <laughs> the past? Same things happen to it. You think so? Yes. M. Butterfly was the only new serious play by an American on the boards. Can you imagine a Broadway season without half a dozen decent yes. plays coming along? Nothing. Nothing. It's, it's a national tragedy. However, that's not only true of um, our theater. The arts reflect the society. I want, walked through a Bethlehem, Pen, uh, East McKeesport, Pennsylvania. Largest steel mills in the world. Closed. So you Every home in America has a VCR. Not one of them made in America. We've lost our entrepreneurial energy. Something's gone wrong with us. We better get it back. And that's that, in our theater and in everything else in life. Whoever dreamed that, that Detroit wouldn't lead the world in making cars? We, that's what we knew how to do. Better than anybody. Yeah. So you think that what's happened in the theater, which means that we've had a falling off in new American plays, but also American musicals, which was our art form. We invented it. Is all a reflection of a total sort of national Something's profile right now. That's right, yes. I, I sincerely believe that. We've lost our... We're not hungry. We're not so, hungry. And we've got to get it back. Well, I'd hate to see, see us get poor again. Exactly. I'd hate to be poor again. But, but we're not hungry. We don't, right. we don't want to get out there and work and, and beat everybody else at it and, and take pride in it. Tony, on that note, we've got to stop. Thank you so much for being with me. I really appreciate it. This has been Spotlight, and my guest has been Tony Randall. I'm Ed Wilson. Thank you for being with us.